road tripping fans, Amish t-shirts are as ferocious as the dunks or bang outs Richard and Channing throw down from time to time, and their softness can't even be matched. Homage has been turning back the clock with throwback tees for years. From the NBA to the ultimate warrior, you know, the tee LeBron wore on the plane after leading the Cavs to its first title the city had seen in over 50 years. Well, Homage tells the stories of triumph, individualism, and hustle, preserving the old school and creating new legacies. Go to homage.com, that's H-O-M-A-G-E, and pay homage with your favorite tee. Be sure to check out the NBA Jam tees and one exclusively made for me and you. And because who doesn't love themselves a nice, healthy discount from now, get this until the end of August, our exclusive road trip and NBA jam tee is 25% off. If you use promo code road trippin upon checkout, that's road trippin, not case sensitive for 25% off. Hey, we're road trippin at homage.com. appropriate way to begin this specific episode than with those lyrics we just heard. We'll get to that in just a minute as we start a new edition of Road Trippin'. I'm your host, Allie Clifton. Rafa, we got it right here back on the soundboard again. And uh, Richard is actually with us as well. Thanks to the magic of technology. I know you wish that you could be here physically, Richard, but what is it, like 16 training days left? Before uh, no, it's like it, we have 30 days until training camp starts. And so when you start breaking down the math, it's like 22 training days. So I, I, I just couldn't afford to get away. But thanks to the magic of technology, I am here and I am looking at you and the doctor. The doctor. All right. Yes. One, yeah. two, oh, good. three, four, five, <laughs> six, seven. <laughs> Exactly. Ben, nine, eight, seven, eight, six, seven. <laughs> <laughs> we are at uh, Total Wine and More. It's fight week. So we are again in Vegas and we are so excited to have the man, the myth, the legend, the doctor with us. So thank you so much for being here. Um, You're welcome. We You're did welcome. think that you were coming off the golf course. Mm hmm. Yeah. So but that didn't happen. But uh, <laughs> a couple of days a week, that's usually the case. And that's where I get my me time. Yeah. yeah. Out okay. there, you know, I mean, I'm not, not great at it. But considering what the average score is in golf, then, you know, I can, I can handle my business. As long as, as, long as you enjoy it. As long as you enjoy yeah, it, that's yeah. all that matters. You don't yeah, have to be man, good at it. It's just it. the space getting out. Getting, it's outdoors. It is a challenge. It's probably the most difficult game that I've ever tried to play. Really? Yeah. Yeah, because there's so many nuances associated with it and so many, you know, I mean, you hit one bad shot. Everybody wants to coach you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. I didn't. I don't remember that happening in basketball. <laughs> you didn't hit me. I mean, shot. the coach was like, he just look at you funny, <laughs> take a bad shot, and, or put you on the bench, but not try to teach you how to shoot. <laughs> and, and they do that in golf, man. You you could be on the range, just hitting, and the ball goes sideways as they sometimes do. And everybody, let me help you out. Let me help you out. <laughs> I'm like, where's your card, man? What kind of, <laughs> <laughs> where's your tour card? You, you, you're not qualified to teach. And if you watch them long enough, they'll do the same thing. Because yeah. golf loves no one. No one. No one. Whether yeah. it was no as a youth, college, yeah. pros, did you ever have a coach pull you for taking a bad shot? Uh, I had him yell. <laughs> and uh, I might have gotten some bench time and just kind of, not known exactly why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was like a mystery. Well, why did he take me out? Everybody else was missing. <laughs> you know, uh, but that's that's what coaching is for. And, you know, doing it this year in the Big Three. You know, I mean, I know it's it's a huge responsibility. It's nothing easy about it. And um, if you just sit there like a bump on the log, people will run you over. Mm-hmm. But uh, but I've always had pretty good coaches. I mean, I, there was one time when I. Uh, gathered uh, all the coaches in my life. You know, it was after I become a professional, <clears throat> and I went back and I tried to, you know, look at my recreation league coaches, my Salvation Army coach, and awesome. uh, elementary school uh, coach. I had a couple of coaches there: middle school, high school, college, and I ended up with twenty-three people in the room. Wow! And wow. you know, I wanted uh, to treat them all to dinner. And see what kind of stories would come out of that uh, that scene. And 
it was it, it's something you probably only do once. Mm-hmm. And, and, I, <laughs> and, I, and I'm so thankful that I did it. You know, thankful that I did it. And you know, most of them are deceased now because I'm 67, and they were all older than me. I mean, you know, many of them were all, uh, young adults and adult adults. You know, when they were when they were coaching me and teaching me, but I learned so much from them and had to, you know, find a way to give them their due. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, just sitting here with you guys just just made me think about that. Think about that at the Marriott Hotel in Hempstead, Long Island. You know, sitting there (laughs) with all those uh, coaches, teachers, mentors and influences in my basketball life. You know, it was it was quite a quite a night. I'm curious, at what point when was that in your professional career? Was it your Uh, your career? It was while I was actually I was playing for the Nets. Okay. So I had um, I had started my pro career after my junior year of college and played two years with the Virginia Squires, mm-hmm. and then I ended up with the New York Nets, where we had a, you know a very successful run, and during that time, living back in Long Island and really, you know, living literally a stone's throw from where I grew up, you know, I was back home. Sort of mm-hmm. like LeBron going back to Cleveland, even though he's from Akron. <laughs> it's just, just, <laughs> just, just a little drive, you know. <laughs> but, it, but it's home. You're in your home state, you know, and you're around familiar surroundings. And then there's people who you knew. And, you know, now everybody knows you because they know of you. And many of them you are able to reciprocate with because you remember, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of people who you grew up with. And then there's always, you know, the pretenders, the strangers. Yeah, we used to be so tight, blah, blah, blah. I've never seen the guy before in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, do you ever have that happen? Uh, you know, I have it, I have it uh, a little bit when I go back to Phoenix. Fortunately, I don't go back to Phoenix that often, and my excuse is always that it's too hot to go there during the off-season. <laughs> it's just, my parents are like, are you going to come visit? I'm like, Mom, it just hit 122. I don't think I need to be hanging out in Phoenix. I was like, I can't train there. But, yeah. no, it's, it's good to know that it doesn't matter what generation – uh, that that kind of aspect of people saying, "Oh, I remember you, and I I knew you when." And you remember how tight we were? That's never going to change. So all all the future generations listening understand that Dr. J experienced it, I experienced it, and you're probably going to experience it also. <laughs> yeah. It goes along yeah. with the territory. Yes, you know, like, yeah. like, so I'll like, take like that. a lot but, of things. It's just uh, yeah. repetitious. Yeah. Well, man, Doc, I, look, man, we don't. It's kind of weird. I, I don't know if you've listened to this podcast. There's only about 12 people that have. But, you know, we we talk we talk a little bit about this. We try and hit a couple of current topics. There's so much that, that I know I want to ask Ali, Rafa, that we, that we want to know, we want to ask. I know the fans have so much. And, man, I don't even know where to begin. I, I just will tell you this from two experiences that I had with you. One, my mom and dad are both from Philadelphia. So okay. they grew up. You know, not grew up, but they're, you know, they were huge Dr. J fans. And so when I moved to Phoenix, it was like, that's how I kind of first fell in love with Charles Barkley because he was a 76er, Mm -hmm. got traded to Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And then my parents were like, oh man, he used to play with the doctor and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So all I heard was the doctor growing up. And then when I get drafted, the first team I go to is the Nets. And you were just everywhere everywhere in the books i had rod thorn was my my general manager yep. uh who who you know very well yes. uh, i think he was an assistant coach on, on he was on assistant coach with the uh, nets he was kevin lockery's assistant yeah and uh and he worked yeah. with the sixers organization for a lot of years yeah so he's oh, a lifetime he's a lifetime basketball yeah guy. yeah rod stole and, money and a, a golfer lot of people and a golfer a and a poker time. player <laughs> yeah, oh, and not a very good one but he is determined he is yeah. determined but you know, one of the things looking back, you know, and, and just kind of reading your 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 bio when um, you got you got your rights got sold in order for the Nets to to come to the NBA. That was part of the whole transition, them moving to New York and your rights got sold to uh, to Philadelphia. Uh and you look at today and all the things that go on with players struggling in free agency because fans get so pissed off, but then fans get pissed off and players get traded too. Mm-hmm. Did you did you have any of that when you kind of had that connection? You had won so many games. You were so successful in the ABA and with the Nets going to Philadelphia. Did you feel any of that animosity between fans or between the two teams? Well, between Philly and New York, the first year – uh, which was 77, uh, 76, 77 season. 
you know, when we went back to Long Island and I was in a, a sixer uniform versus Nets, and we had come off of winning the last ABA championship, and, uh, you know, I was a three-time MVP in the league, the last three years of the league. Yeah. So, yeah, there were a lot of mixed emotions. Uh, uh, I, I think there were some people who were probably pissed off, but uh, most people, you know, just um, they had a lot of respect. And I think when <clears throat> you build respect, then they don't stay mad at you. You know, they yeah. just get get over it. It's done. This is a business, you know, just like I guess when – Kyrie goes back to Cleveland this year or Isaiah goes back to Boston, you know, hopefully there'll be people who will say, you know, thanks for what you gave us during the time that you were here, but you're in a, a business where this happens and, Mm -hmm. um, and, and we can't change it. You know, we can't wish it away. We can't will it away. You know, only thing, only way you could change it is to do another deal. And that's not inclined to happen. So, uh, by playing with, uh, three different franchises uh, during my career. You know, I had that experience of going back to, you know, play against the old franchise. I started with Virginia, so when I became a net, you know, I, I went back to Virginia, and I, I just remember there was this one sign that <laughs> stood out, <laughs> and it said, New York paid you superstar, but Virginia made you what you are. <laughs> oh. And all game long, I would look over there. They'd be, <laughs> they'd be waving that baby. <laughs> and I was like, all right, I can't look over there. <laughs> well, he caught your eye. He caught your eye. That's all. He, he 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 accomplished his mission with that. No, that that's awesome, man. I, I'm glad to get you know because you are truly a legend. Not o- not only in our sport, but just in you know sports in America in general. And so to just to kind of see what's going on and see how guys get so frustrated. You know, Ray Allen is still mm-hmm. beefing with guys from Boston and, and that yeah. random, that right. random beef. And he's like, get over it. You know, you see guys oh, burning, j- burning jerseys or guys, you know, talking trash, <clears throat> going back and forth. And you're like, look, guys need to do what's best for their family. You know, Kevin Durant went, went through it. Uh, yeah. Gordon Hayward going yeah. to Boston. There's always this lack of loyalty, but the first second a team gets, if they need a financial help or if they want, feel like it makes them better, they'll trade you. And, you know, team people don't stop supporting their own team, but they'll quick to kind of get on a player. Yeah. And for me, <clears throat> it's, it's a little known story, but uh, when, I left, it, when, I, when I left, when I left UMass, yeah. And uh, I was I was an underclassman, so you know I played freshman ball, then two varsity seasons because back in the day you played freshman ball when you were a freshman. Yeah. And uh, we had an undefeated freshman team, and we had a, a, a my sophomore year, you know we had a good team, eighteen and eight. We went to the NIT because we got snubbed by the NCAA. Then the next year we're twenty three and three, and we get snubbed by the NCAA because we didn't have automatic bids. And uh, so we go back to the NIT. <clears throat> Both years in the NIT, you know, we, we lost to the eventual winner, which was Marquette in uh, the first, my sophomore year and then North Carolina in my uh, junior year. So, so now we get to that off season, and there's a lot going on. And this kind of agent comes around, a guy named Steve Arnold, and he says, you know, I have a team that's really interested in, in Julius. And, you know, he spoke to my high school coach and spoke to uh, – one of my um, friends from high school who was an advisor. And, uh, you know, we had this secret meeting at the uh, Philadelphia Motel. <laughs> <laughs> I came down from UMass. They came up from Virginia. And after two days, you know, they had basically made me an offer that I couldn't refuse. I mean, it was, yeah. you know, the economics, just to do the math, it would probably take my parents 50 years to earn what they were offering me. What, what year was this? <laughs> this is 1971. So uh, uh, NCAA, I just want to let you guys know uh, that illegal meetings have been going on since 1971. Uh, illegal, illegal meetings with agents have been going on since they got, They're about to strip you, man. Doctor, I did this the exact same thing. You know, you sit down and, and somebody kind of gives you that, hey, this is where you're projected. This is the number of those projections, yeah. Yeah. what do you want to do? And you're like, man, I had a great run at school. Yeah. <laughs> <I really laughs> yeah. so. Well, well, the the point is, uh, I ended up signing, 
And then I ended up leaving, you know, my teammates and my coach and the university structure that, you know, that I enjoyed very well and, you know, moved on. And suddenly what I was doing for fun, you know, I was now doing as my for my life. And I became a full-time basketball player and a part-time student. And the pattern started there, you know, where you, as you were saying, Richard, that, you know, you have to make decisions that are in the best interest of you, you and your family. And, you know, somebody's going to get hurt in, in the process. Somebody's going to get disappointed in the process. But, you know, either way, that's going to happen. Because if you decide to do nothing, the same thing is going to happen. Somebody's going to be disappointed and it's probably going to be you. Yeah. 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 And it's exactly to that point what LeBron just spoke out on social media with. You know, Richard, we were talking about that the other day. He kind of spoke out in defense of uh, Isaiah with people burning his jersey now. You know, if if you choose as a player to go to a different franchise, you're considered a traitor, you know, or mm. or the guy that left. But if it becomes a business decision or, or you get traded, it's it's a business decision. As LeBron said, you got to do what's best for your family, for yourself, for – you know, the overall. It, it doesn't last forever. I mean, you know, the economics, as it seems like, would be something to take care of the rest of your life. But I think the more you make, the more you spend. And uh, if you're a pro for 18 years or whatever, you know, you look at the 18 years versus the life expectancy, which is now 80. So, you know, it's less than 20 percent of your life. And yeah. uh, and you can carve the numbers up any way, shape or form that you want. Um I don't think in any uh, career uh, you're set for life. Mm -hmm. You know, you're set for the time that you're there and maybe a a period afterwards. But unless you're very shrewd and and very lucky, you know, you still got to do something else after you get out. Mm -hmm. You have to figure figure out what that is. That's why we're here talking on this podcast. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) You want to you want to know the secret sauce, huh? <laughs> Richard's trying, trying to, to figure it out. As, yeah, I'm trying to hold I, on as long as I can, Doc. Yeah. But man, I, I'm just trying to figure out. And, and for me, uh, you know, me, Ali, Rafa, mm-hmm. Channing, mm-hmm. Uh, all the people involved with this, mm-hmm. I think it's awesome to tell these stories, to sit mm-hmm. down with players and tell these stories. So yeah, no, you're right. You have to figure out something to do. You can't just play golf all day. <laughs> no, no, and and know know what you want to. Uh, because that set of friends would probably be hustling you, <laughs> you know, <laughs> while, your, close uh, while, while your real cool friends are probably working, putting in, you yeah. know, putting in the nine to five. And just, uh, well, two things. One, uh, I have a lot of respect for you. Uh, you know, I've admired your career. Uh, you know, so when, when you and Luke Walton first came in together, <laughs> y'all was boys, you know, and yeah. so on and so forth. And his career hasn't lasted as, as long or, you know, has, hasn't done as well. And he, he might have been projected a little bit ahead of you in terms of uh, upside mm-hmm. potential. So um, just sharing that with you and and, uh, you. and the fact that, you know, you do a lot of big hand stuff going down the lane, dunking yeah. the ball or whatever. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, that part of the game, I mean, I like that shot better than the three-point shot, you know. So, yeah. Because so, yeah. so, uh-huh. so, that, that's jumping. the man up shot right there, especially yeah. when, when you, know, you go in on the seven-footers. Yeah. And all those guys, you know, who want to be shot blockers and whatever, mm-hmm. and you just like, okay, it's either going to be me or him. Yeah. You know? it's, it's <laughs> let's see how this turn. Let's see how this turns out. You know? yeah. Luke Walton, <laughs> one of the best highlights. Doctor, ladies and gentlemen, oh, my God, ever since I was a kid, like that long arm, like <laughs> watching you go in on Big Bill. Yeah, 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 that's bro. Yeah, you got a whole. Bill Walton came on this podcast. He didn't let anybody else talk. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, just that long arm. Now I don't have I don't have hands like the doctor, but I can Uh palm a ball pretty good. Yeah. And so just you know, again, just watching young highlights when I was a kid and watching the old because you know they used to have those like. Uh, hip hop videos with like old yeah. NBA stuff, and, right. and you and just your ability to move that ball with just one yeah. hand and go. Oh, one of my idols here. So just yeah. to hear you say that is, is yeah. Amazing. No, I have, I have to give you your props. <laughs> you know, <laughs> now I didn't see you yeah uh, <laughs> in your prime. But I understand, I you know, video. you took care, you took care, you took video. care of your business, and you <laughs> yeah. at Toledo, you know, my boy Steve Mix is old <laughs> school and whatever. So I, I got, you know, uh, a lot of Toledo stuff 
fed into my ears during those eight years right. when he and I were roommates. I don't know if that's with the Sixers. Or... No, no, it was cool, man. I couldn't wait to see the place. Yeah, I still, still can't wait to see the place. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the, doc, the doctor had roommates, huh? So that's what it was. You guys. Had yeah, roommates. yeah. We, well, we had a choice. You know, after four years, we we were rooming together for four years, and then that's when they came with everybody getting single rooms. You know, yeah. but you had to uh, give back some of your per diem in order to get a single room. And Steve and I said, well, we just going to room together. I ain't giving back none of my per diem. <laughs> he all right with me. He knows everything there is to know, and I know everything there is to know. You know, so. Did you guys have yeah. an alias back then? Uh, his name. Say, <laughs> 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 so that's, Steve's, that's Steve's room. <laughs> Uh, I think this is a great segue, though, because of you talk about the dunking. We were just talking about the dunking. Mm. And Richard is going into his 17th season. Um, however, mm. he's still able to kind of throw some down. It's amazing. But four short years ago, you were still able to throw some down. Yeah. So what's your secret that maybe <coughs> Richard could? Uh, I think it's in the genes. I mean, really, it's, it's, uh, you get long arms, and, uh, you get the hops. And if you have the confidence that you can get up there and come down and make a safe landing, <laughs> then it's going <laughs> to then it's going to encourage you to do it. But you know, if you get one of those shaky landings, if your landing gear goes out, then yeah. you you no longer have the air brake. And yeah. he knows about the air brake because he you know oh, yeah. goes yeah. up and put the air brake yeah. on and wait for them to go by. Then and then bam, you, fly. you know <laughs> so. So, oh, the doctor, uh, one of the best air brakes. You know what I don't have anymore, Doc, um, is brakes. So, <laughs> I don't have brakes. So if I get going really, really fast yeah. and the lane clears, I'm in a good space. But yeah. if I'm going really, really fast. You're going to run somebody break, over? <laughs> yeah, I just run them over. And, I, and I'll apologize. My teammates are like, yeah, you couldn't stop. I was like, no, nah, I couldn't stop anymore. But, you know, How much do you just, weigh? How much do you weigh? Me, I, I'm right now about 235. So I, I've okay. done a good job of trying to keep myself yeah. down and trying to keep myself self slim and uh i'm gonna try and play this year at 230 okay. um you know but uh yeah yeah it's not easy it yeah. is not easy yeah well i came in at 195 wow and i left at 225 after 16 yeah. after 16 years yeah so that was pretty good i weigh 240 now yeah but i've been as high as 260 something Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> had to had to get rid of that. What were you doing at, you, were you doing to, at 260? Playing golf. I, <laughs> playing I, golf. Me and George, yeah, yeah. I was getting like George Gervin, you know, because Gervin. Oh, oh, oh. Gervin, Gervin's about 285 now. 285. And you weren't walking. You weren't riding the cart. <laughs> so, you, so you guys, nah, so you man, guys I, got, I, got the, I got the Fitbit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I told him I want 4,500 oh, steps a day. And there's some weeks, you know, when I get to thirty, forty thousand. Wow. And if I play golf twice, I'm probably gonna get between ten and fifteen each of those times. You know, even with the cart. Now yeah. if you just walk, period, you'll be over twenty thousand. Oh but, wow. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's it's like a nice little device. What yeah. would it be like if someone just kinda tagged along? It was a fly on the wall with you and George and wasn't it Clyde, Clyde today? Yeah, yeah. Out yeah. on the golf course. They, yeah. they would have they would have had a good time. <laughs> <laughs> because, because, uh, and, and Richard will experience this probably in you know another ten years or so, just looking back post career and and finding time to spend with uh, people who you haven't seen in a long time, who you were really connected with, who you were seeing multiple times a week, you know, like his teammates in, in Cleveland. Uh, you know, you see those guys sometimes more than he sees. The family, mm -hmm. obviously, his parents, if they live in Arizona, you know, and, yeah. and so there's some people you see, you know, more than you see family and friends, and they become your, your group, you know, mm -hmm. your party, and then you get away from that, and suddenly, you know, sports probably not as important to you, so some of them will still cling to basketball and basketball related things because they might go into coaching, teaching, training. Or whatever, and and you know you move on, so you move on with your business life or your other personal interests, and then when you reconnect, the big three this year was a reconnection for me and George Gervin, Clyde Drexler, Rick Mahorn, and um, Charles Oakley, and and then meeting guys who <clears throat> who are part of an era that I didn't play in, and and I didn't really pay a whole lot of attention to. It was Bonzi Wells and Mike James, one of my team, Jermaine O'Neal, they were on my team. 
and just, you know, spending some time around those guys and recognizing that, you know, we are really all, you know, connected because of the game and the beauty of the game, mm -hmm. uh, whether you're a Hall of Famer or whether you're just a guy who had a cup of coffee in the league. You know, you still have you still have that connection. And, and it's kind of nice. It's uh, it's nice. It's not, it's, it's not, you know, something that uh, you depend on in any way, shape, or form. It's not something that, um, you know, makes you or breaks you. But it does uh, make your life better in terms of just the special memories. Because George and I, I mean, I, my first year in, in the ABA, uh, midway through uh, the second season, Charlie Scott, who was a great basketball player, left the team and joined the Phoenix Suns, <clears throat> and we needed to replace him. And this guy named Willie Merriweather brings George Gervin, who had just gotten suspended from Eastern Michigan. And he had, he had, yeah, he had an incident, <laughs> so he got kicked out of school. <laughs> and and uh, so George, you know, comes to the Squires, and you know, there's this debate. You know, obviously, we needed a, a shooting guard. And Charlie Scott was gone, and Charlie, you know, had like a 33-point average his, the year before. <clears throat> and uh, I was a rising star. So I go to, you know, see George work out. And uh, Merriweather's saying, well, you know, see, y'all got that three-point line. And the NBA did not have, didn't have the three-point line. He said, you know, that's a layup for my man. I was like, a layup? <laughs> I know, but I get out there, I got to heave it. You know what I'm <laughs> so George gets out there, and he starts, you know, he's he's like six, seven and a half, six, eight, 177 pounds, dripping oh, wet. Wow. Yeah. Dripping wet. So he really after is. After having a burger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After, <laughs> after eating, right? So, so, so I'm looking at this guy, and he's, he's like cocking the ball, and he's. He's just letting it float, and they're just going in one after another for three-point shots. And I'm like, this is good. <laughs> this is good. <laughs> Got like a weapon here. So then they let George basically shoot for his contract. And he got a decent contract. Um, I think back in those days, you know, I was probably making my first four years, my salary was 125000 payable over seven years, which wow. means they were giving me 71000 a year. Payable over seven for four years of work or whatever. So, you know, they're probably giving George maybe 50, uh, whatever. So, I mean, you know, you can't even relate to these numbers, can you, Richard? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> or whatever. That's like the per diem. That's like, that's like the per diem, right? That's the meal. That's the meal money, right? <laughs> no, I get that. Yeah. Because the, the thing that makes, it, that makes it very understanding is when you said earlier, I looked at how much they were offering and i compared that to how much my parents were going to make in yeah. a lifetime yeah. so it, it's the exact same thing right you know you look at it like how, how long will it take my parents to make this like right. they're not going to make this amount of money no. over their course of the life no. and so just in that perspective it doesn't matter if it was the, the 70s 80s 90s we were able to as athletes and in professions we were able to do what our parents could never do in their right. entire lives right and that's that's one of the goals. You I mean you want to yeah. have your kids surpass whatever it is, whatever level standard that you set. You know, you want your have your kids surpass that. So, you know, I, I look at two of my friends down there. One's a lawyer, and one's an engineer. So I'm just thinking about their kids and the, and the challenge. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's going to be rough on your kids. <laughs> but that's what you want for them. You know, you want them to be better, uh, better off, and uh, to live a better lifestyle. So. You gotta work hard to do that, and and plant that seed in their minds and in their hearts, and uh, go to those private schools. Yeah. Oh, no, Channing! Where did he go? I went to a public school, and I keep trying to decide on whether or not to send my kid to a, to a private school. I was like, I, I think uh, public school can kind of build character, so we'll see. Mm. We'll see if I if I let little Richard get in there. But <laughs> I I want to I want to ask you about the the big three. Okay. Uh, I, I want to say first and foremost as not only just a fan of basketball, but a fan of you, it was great to see you out because you kind of pick your spots. You're very selective. Like you'll show up at a dunk contest at All-Star mm -hmm. Weekend. <laughs> you'll have your spots. You'll do an interview now and then. 
but as far as like being really in the public eye like a ton and and, and back on tv and involved in the game and and kind of coaching and talking th- that was the first time that I've, I've really seen you extensively it, it is in the big three did you enjoy it was it fun what are your thoughts on it um first thing i think about is the camaraderie mm-hmm. <clears throat> you know with the guys who uh, who i mentioned who were other coaches so there was eight coaches and there's 40 players so I, I didn't spend a whole lot of time around the 40 players. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I knew Bibby a little bit because uh, his dad and I played together in, with, mm-hmm. in Philadelphia, Henry, and uh, Chauncey because, you know, Chauncey's out and about and, and he's a golfer. <clears throat> and, um, you know, but, but a lot of guys, I mean, you know, Deshaun Jackson, I mean, it was like, I never, saw, <laughs> I never saw this guy play. Then he beats us with a game winner. So yeah. I have to call him the dagger after week one because he started, <laughs> he started a downward spiral after that first game. Yeah. And uh, Steve and Jackson, you know, talk a lot of junk, whatever. And I had seen him because I like San Antonio. San Antonio is kind of like my favorite NBA team. So I, okay. I had seen him uh, in, in a limited capacity because, I, I, you know, I didn't watch as much basketball in the last 10 or 15 years as obviously I did the previous 15 years. And then it's this year is thirty years since being out of basketball. Wow! So wow. so it's my thirtieth anniversary of not being a professional basketball player. Was there a reason? Which why is you stopped? which is almost twice as long as I was in there. Hmm? Was there a reason why you stopped watching the NBA? Uh, stopped watching. Uh, just got busy with other things: family, uh, friends, business, and uh, you know, trying to uh, better myself in terms of. Um, understanding the world and understand why I'm here. So, uh, you know, I got very philosophical at a certain just certain uh, junctions. And also uh, I, I thought, and I, this would be my advice to Richard, if he were to ask, you know, that uh, diversifying, you know, your endeavors after you've been in something long term, term that is uh, singular and, and basketball is singular and it takes a singular type of dedication to be the best. And even if you're not the best uh, in the game, you got to still try to be the best you that you can be. So that takes that singular focus. And um, and so so I knew after I got out, it wasn't going to be about one thing anymore. You know, it was going to be about diversifying my business endeavors, my, my lifestyle. You know, so I went on some company boards and uh, started, you know, holding, holding companies and uh, – You know, just kind of en- enlisted in areas and in technology, medical, and uh, education, you know, that I had personal interest in, my charity interests uh, uh, blossomed during that time. So <clears throat> I didn't want any two weeks to be the same, you know. Awesome. It, it wasn't going to be that type of schedule that was regimented as the basketball schedule was where during the season or for nine months out of the year, you were going to have this repetition every week same drill you know go to the airport and <laughs> get practice, on a plane go there practice shoot around game dinner party whatever it is you know that's just that routine I didn't I didn't want it to be that type of routine and I look back on it and could I have done it differently would I be much different if it were not done that way uh, I think so you know I probably uh, you know maybe you know to Rich's point Uh, might be more visible, maybe have a bigger image, you know, uh, name, face, likeness, you know, might be more fully exploitable. But I wouldn't trade the way I've done it, um, even knowing that, because I did it my way. Yeah, the best way. When yeah. that 16th season came, was it tough to walk away from the game? Well, there's a Cleveland story in here. <laughs> there's always a there's always a Cleveland story, right? So I'm in season 15, and uh, and uh, we were playing out of outside of Cleveland. Where was the place? What's the name of the area where the arena is? Richfield. Yeah, oh. we, Richfield. Richfield Stadium. Yeah. So we're out there, and we're staying at the best hotel in the area, which wasn't that good or whatever. And uh, it's February. It's either January or February. And and literally, my knees are, like, inflamed. I mean, the, the tendonitis was hurting me so bad that night. 
might have had something to do with the eight feet of snow that was outside <laughs> or the fact that the temperature was probably like 10 degrees. And uh, and I, I, I got on the floor and I grabbed my pillow, put it between my legs. I put a pillow under my head and whatever. And I, I was I was like suffering. I mean, I was like, man, this is it. <laughs> you know, this this is this is it. I mean, physically, I just said, you know, this is it. Uh, I'm going to do everything in my power to play one more season because I didn't want to end on an odd number. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that was like my 15th season. So, yeah. So, so I announced before that season that this would be it no matter what. I don't care how I play, what happens to our team or whatever. This is it. So I, and, and I always felt – that by coming into pro basketball through the ABA as an underclassman, that I had come in the side door and I wanted to go out the front door on my own terms. And, you know, that year, I mean, it, we had a tremendous farewell tour. And I remember John Havlicek's farewell tour, and ours was bigger and better <laughs> than his, <laughs> than his, which was, you know, since we had that rivalry with Boston, you know, it was, that was an accomplishment. But, uh, you know, people, the outpouring of uh, love and and, uh, respect uh, during that time, you know, made me feel that this was the right decision. And the time, you know, I was I still I made the all star team. And, you know, even though I was playing two guard, which was a totally foreign position for me (laughs) my last two years. And Matt Gugas was coaching and um, I, I was playing out of position, but I was playing. You know, nonetheless, yeah. and uh, and we went to the playoffs that year. We we lost to Milwaukee in the first round, and we had a tremendous rivalry with Boston and with Milwaukee. And we'd always beat Milwaukee, and then somehow lose to Boston. So uh, this year, Milwaukee beat us. So I really wasn't mad at them. You know, I was just like, yeah. man, they got one on us. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and you know, left the game through the front door. I mean, and that was, that was important to do. Because I remember yeah, you talk. Go ahead, Allie. No, you got it, Rich. You go, Allie. Okay. Yeah, you go, Allie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, because I just I was watching. Um, I've, oh, okay. I right. got you. Um, I remember I've been watching. I was watching um, several interviews, and you were talking about how you kind of felt like you went in the side door, but you left coming out the front door. Mm-hmm. But my question here is because also in that same interview, I believe you were talking about how your hands were an extension of your mind. So, in your prime, is there a player in today's game that you feel could handle you? Uh, we always thought basketball <clears throat> one-on-one was was great and isolating always put responsibility on the defense to come in double team or triple team and uh you know I never thought that you know there was there was a player who could just play me one-on-one mm-hmm. you know I, I I don't want to concede that to any any one player there are players who could slow you down but they're not going to stop you I mean if you if you grew up playing basketball in, in the playgrounds, and particularly in New York playgrounds or Chicago playgrounds or whatever, I mean, you know, you got more moves than Carter has liver pills. You know, so, <laughs> <laughs> so how are they gonna stop you? You don't even know. You don't even know what you're gonna do. So how are they gonna know what you're gonna do, right? <laughs> so, so, so they, they'd have to have some help, and um, and that's why you know one of the beauties of the game is to have strategic help where you could fake help. You could actually come in double team, and now you're playing, you know, four against three. But you know, guys know the positions to be in to uh, not let it work to their disadvantage. And you know, you got to take the hand. You got to take the ball out of the hands of great players. I mean, if you just, it's just like, and Richard, you get lots of times get tough defensive assignments, yeah. whatever. And you know, you take up that challenge. You say, all right, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna shut them down. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. Yeah. Or whatever. Okay, he got away that time, but you know, I would, have, I would get him next time <laughs> or whatever. Well, and, the, and, and you know, Doc, like that's the key to a mindset of a guy. It's like I know that you cannot stop him. I know yeah. that. Like you can't stop him, Cole. You, my, can. you can't stop him. And so my only job is to make it as difficult as possible, exactly. right? Like don't give up a layup. Exactly. Don't lose your assignment and yeah. give him an open shot. Don't yeah. give him anything easy. Yeah. But if he hits a contested shot or yeah. a fadeaway – then you can't lose your confidence. You just go, okay, he got that he one. Got Let's that. try it. Yep, <laughs> yep. And, that, and that's what makes great players great because they find a way, you know, to, to score and, and contribute to their team's success the way that they can. And, uh, 
And unless you double, triple team. And, then, and when you do that, somebody else got to step up if you put the double yeah. or triple team on. And mm-hmm. uh, it puts pressure on your team. That's why it's a team game. Mm-hmm. You know, it's uh, you know they, <clears throat> a lot of people like to talk about the championship count. And, you know, Robert Ory's got six rings, seven rings. and Seven. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> seven rings. He was on our podcast. He's, he's <laughs> talking about it. And, and uh, about Dennis Robbins got six four. rings and, you know, so on and so forth. And, you know, the ring count and between ABA and NBA, I went to the finals six times. Three times we won, three times we lost. And um, the team lost and the team won. You know, I didn't win nothing. I, I, if I was out there by myself, if it was one on one, if it was a, a fight, or if it was golf match, or you know something where it really is one on one, then you could lay claim to that. But you know, in the NBA and the ABA or whatever the basketball league, the NCAA, the best team wins. The best team, yeah. best team prevails. And if you're a part of that team, great. You know, you could end up with a lot of hardware <laughs> <laughs> if they win yeah. over and over yeah. and over. That, that's true because. I've been on, I've been to the finals four times, uh, mm-hmm. and and five if you include the NCAA. But I've been to the finals four times, and in not one of those finals was I ever the favorite. Like my mm-hmm. rookie year, it was our first year. We had no business really kind of being there because we just got thrown together, and we lose to the three-time champions, uh, Shaq and Kobe. Mm-hmm. Next year, next year we go and we're a little bit more confident. We we kind of understand the route, and we lose to. Tim Duncan and David Robinson, right. <laughs> uh, the Twin Towers, right? And right. David Robinson's on his farewell tour. Tim Duncan is about right. to be one of the great, great players of any generation. Right. Fast forward, you know, we make we win the championship last year, but we beat a 73-win team, right? right? We weren't favored in that series. Exactly. And then this year, a 73-win team adds Kevin Durant. So you can look and be like, well, Richard, you were one and three in the finals. And it's right. like, yeah, <laughs> but, you know. That's not, you, the, that's not the look. You know, you, you were the there. You had the experience. And you got beat by a better team. I mean, you know, seven game series. And when you could lose in a seven game series, that team is better. Yeah. That particular year. But so you got to, you know, uh, revel in the fact that, you know, you're part of that experience, and you, you've mm-hmm. done it multiple times. So it does give you, uh, you know, credibility, and it validates your career to a degree. But, you know, uh, when they talk about LeBron and <clears throat> the number of times that he's been there versus number of times they've won, he's won, and his teams have won, and make the comparisons to Michael Jordan or others or whatever. Sometimes I just laugh at it. It's like the fans' argument. You know, they, can yeah. argue, they can argue all day. They can always find something to argue about. But nobody's going to be on thir- uh, 11 championship teams in 13 years mm-hmm. like, yeah. you, like you know who. <laughs> yeah, Big Russell. Bill Russell. <laughs> Bill. Bill Russell. Yeah. Yeah. They could, they could talk about era if they want. I'd love to have you on here, yeah. Big Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Hey guys, Rafael Alcalde with you guys. Before we continue with this awesome episode, I want to remind you about the great offer that our friends at Casper Mattress have for all our listeners. If you visit casper.com slash road, you get $50 off the purchase of any mattress. Remember, use the promo code ROAD, R-O-A-D, at checkout. Don't take my word for it. Channing and RJ are already sleeping soundly in their own Casper mattress. And for me, in all of my 20 years in broadcasting and road tripping experience with the NFL, Major League Baseball, Boxing, USC, and now the NBA, I have always struggled with the quality of mattresses the hotels provide, not to mention that I have never found one for my home that completely satisfies my needs. You see, all my life I have suffered from back problems because of the horrible mattresses out there, but a friend of mine suggested I give Casper Mattress a try and I will forever be indebted to her. Casper Mattress is an obsessively engineered mattress at a shockingly fair price. And when I found out that with Casper, you not only get free shipping and returns to the U.S. and Canada, and that you can actually try it for a hundred nights risk-free in your own home, and if you don't love it, they will pick it up and refund everything, I jump on the offer. Don't take my word for it. Give it a try yourself and see if an awesome fair price mattress with supportive memory foams that create an award-winning sleep surface with just the right sink and bounce is right for you. Visit casper.com slash 
R O A D and get fifty dollars off the purchase of your mattress. And if that is not enough, Casper is not only designed, developed, and assembled in the United States of America, just like road tripping, it is also quickly becoming the internet favorite mattress with over twenty thousand reviews and an average of four point eight stars. Make sure you use the promo code ROAD, R-O-A-D, at checkout to get $50 off the purchase of any mattress. Get your Casper mattress today, and you'll thank me later. Welcome to Total Wine & More. It's much more than a wine store. It's the eighth wonder of the world. When people talk about Total Wine & More, they get a little carried away. We're just a big, friendly place run by people with a passion for wine, beer, and spirits. On your left is every Chardonnay ever made. Now, that's an exaggeration. It's only about 750 Chardonnays. See, we travel the world to find the best wines from the best regions, and we sell them at the lowest prices anywhere. 8,000 different wines. Okay, that one's true. 2,500 different beers. Uh, true. 3,000 spirits. True. And friendly, helpful experts at every turn. Okay, yeah, that's also true, but... And Total Wine & More always has unbeatable prices. You know what? Maybe we are the eighth wonder of the world. And here we have a man who's bragging. Sorry. No problem. Now open in Arboretum, Sunset Valley, and Lakeline. Shop online at TotalWine.com. Always the right bottle. Uh, I want to take a moment really quick, Richard, because I think you'd be very proud when I look around. We're here, as I mentioned at the beginning, at uh, Total Wine and More, and there's about 25 people um, here for this podcast right now. Just some fans that have come in. There's some Cleveland fans here that we met at the beginning. Wow. Oh, yeah. Am we I can hear you. It's okay. Uh, I know you've got some friends with you as well. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Total Wine and More is, is, of team. course, yeah, yeah. an official uh, sponsor now of Road Trippin' and as we mentioned on the last episode, 8,000 different wines here at this place. It's so nice. Uh, about 2,500 different beers, microbrews. Um, you've got about 3,000 spirits, which we are kind of enjoying right now. I got a rosé. Um, I'm a big rosé girl. What are you drinking, Doc? I got a little tequila here. A little tequila? Yeah, tequila, lime, and ice. So you, so you switched yeah. to tequila because you said the red wine got a little too much sugar. <laughs> Uh, yeah, what, yeah, what. red wine and the and the, <laughs> and the and the normal browns uh, have too much sugar. So oh, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I, I, I had like a, a whiskey I, guy. Yeah, I had a diagnosis. So I'm a type two diabetic. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So I needed to cut back on the sugar, and that's when I was at that like two sixty. I was oh, going to ask you, was that the 260 So right? that 260 <laughs> turned to 240 real quick. You know, it probably yeah. took about two months. Doctor, oh wow. Yeah, and then that was just from less sugar intake. I know you're yeah. a tequila fan. Yeah. I wanted to show you this one. This is an Avion 44. That's a 44? Etched with oh. Floyd Mayweather and oh, hand okay. signed by Floyd. What? And they have him here at Throw Wine. It's only 150. All right, so you can let me look at it? I'll you can hold it. <laughs> Richard has one, but you can look at Richard it. Richard has one. I can look fan. at it. You're, you're hey, everybody, let me look at the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> if I was an alcoholic, I'd be upset. <laughs> Are you going to let me look that at the good. bottle? <laughs> <laughs> the cool thing about... Cool you go. got Floyd. They I see. No, that's yeah. hot. And that the, is hot. The cool thing about this bottle, I don't know. I'm going to educate you a little bit. Mm -hmm. Is 44 stands for... Um, it was in a barrel for 43 months, mm. and then they took it out for the last month, the 44th month. Am I oh. doing this right, Matt? Okay. They put okay. it in a new barrel for the final month, and that's what that's where the name 44. And that's is what that you're what drinking. You're drinking? Is that what the doctor's drinking? That's what the doctor's drinking. Okay. I'm sipping on it. Sipping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just sipping. Sipping on it over here. You know, I'm, a, I'm a sipper. Let me tell you something about Toledo people. I couldn't handle that. No? I tried it yesterday, so props to you. <laughs> uh, you want to taste? Oh, I, did. I already did. <laughs> I, I can't handle it. Yeah. yeah. Um, hey, I, I do want to get your thoughts because we actually have some fans <clears throat> from Philadelphia um, here and friends of the podcast. Who's from Philly? Philly? All right. Hey, there All we right. go. We've All got right. some fans from Philly. All right. Um, trust the process. The big, the big uh, slogan motto mm -hmm. for them. I, I know you had discussed about um, Joel Embiid and, of course, Ben Simmons being a great sign. Do you trust the process? Well, I mean, what's your your outlook with Philly? Well, I, I think a season in the NBA is an eternity, mm -hmm. and uh, and therefore, you know, if you're going to be good overnight, you 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 need to do it in a season, not in. In seven seasons, 
but uh, but if you want to change the face of the franchise and then create and they see there's see there are multiple agendas associated with the process. It's not to you know f- totally to field a championship team. It's to uh, get a team that can sustain you know the support of the public, public and private, uh, redirect the franchise you know away from being a spoiler. Um, get um, individuals who are part of the franchise who have you know a personal type of character, charisma, as well as talent, and uh, so so the process is 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 all of that and some. Um, so uh, so with Brett Brown, <coughs> I think he's articulated that to management, and he's kind of been given certain assurances that okay, we'll give you a certain amount of time, and and with that time, you know we expect results. Mm-hmm. Now, if you really look at the pool of young talent on the Sixers, uh, with Fultz and and with uh, Embiid and uh, Simmons, Simmons um, you know, if I were if I were going to look at young players right now, and you took a pool of thirty, they would be in there, and maybe uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Sarcherick. Sarich. 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 Don't, look, don't Sarich. look at me like Sarich. I'm Sarich. <laughs> All right. All right. Sarich. You know, Sarich. 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 Sarich, right? Yeah, Sarich. So, yeah. so you got four players who are in the top 30 in their peer group. Now, they're not four of the top 30 players in the league, even though and, – and I would put Okafer in the conversation uh, somewhere. So now you have five of the top 30 young players, you know, with one franchise. But – our friend Bill Russell, he used to, <laughs> he used to always say, "Can you curse on this?" Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can oh, say whatever okay. the hell you want. All right, so, absolutely. So he said, "You know, a lot of people talk to me about experience, but you know, experience don't mean shit. <laughs> <laughs> you got to perform." And this is what this is one of my main mentors, who I was with last weekend up in Seattle, and uh, I said, are you, "Are you for real about that, Bill?" He says, "Yeah." He says, "You know, because." You could have the most experienced team in the world, but if they don't get out there and perform, put the work in, and do what needs to be done, they're going to lose. So experience unto itself doesn't win and doesn't assure you of anything. So the flip side of that is because guys are young and inexperienced, it doesn't mean they have to lose. You know, if they get the yeah. right mindset, they get the mental frame of mind, and they physically you know, pay the dues and understand basketball is not rocket science. You know, you just got to defend, and then you got to score more points than the other team. And uh, in statistical categories, certain statistical categories, if you can be dominant, be dominant. You know, sometimes, yeah, well, dom- you- sometimes domination in one statistical category could knock two or three things out that you're failing in and, uh, and balance it out. No, and, and to your point, uh, experience doesn't mean shit. I was with the Warriors the first year they made the playoffs. And I know Cleveland fans are going to be so annoyed anytime (laughs) I reference my time with the Warriors. But (laughs) they they drafted Harrison Barnes. Mm -hmm. Uh, Clay Thompson was in his second year. Um, uh, Steph was only in his third or fourth year. Uh, And uh, Draymond Green was a rookie. Mm -hmm. And these were four or five guys that were – Important, and they made they made the second round of the playoffs. They beat they beat Denver, yeah. who had one fifty seven wins. So you could say you know George Carl was coach of the year that year. Mm-hmm. Uh, they won fifty seven games, and a team that had zero experience and had two rookies and uh, a guy in Clay Thompson, who his rookie year the year before was coming off a lockout year. Uh, so he was basically like a rookie because he hadn't played eighty two games. Yep. And th- this young team, you know, wins. 49 games and then goes on and goes to the second round. So yeah, yeah experience doesn't mean no, anything. Not, it doesn't guarantee, it doesn't guarantee, it doesn't anything, guarantee, for guarantee sure. anything. Cause that was a very inexperienced team. And Mark Jackson was only in his second year as yeah. a head coach. Yeah. So it was like, there was really no experience to fall on. And that, that's a, just a good example of what you were talking and about. And there will be more of that rather than less of that because the league is getting younger and younger, you know, 19 out of the first 30 guys that got drafted were 19 year olds. Yeah. Whatever. So the league is getting younger, and and the league is set up for young people to be successful, mm-hmm. you know, because they're bringing them in earlier and they're getting the minutes. And you know, yeah. you know what minutes comes down to at the well, end well, of the yeah, day. No if if, yeah. if you get no minutes, you can't show what you can do. But if well, you get that, minutes, that, 
You that's get the minutes. You... argument. Everybody wants minutes. I'm not getting enough minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot. So but that's still going on, too. So that was going on 30, 30 years ago, too, about the, about the minutes. How many minutes am I going to get tonight, Coach? Yeah, but, that, but that, you know, I, I, try, I try and tell the young guys or try and tell I was like, look, don't complain about your five minutes because five minutes can really quickly go to zero. And exactly. Like, and you I, can go I, the I, other I, way. I, yeah, go the other way. And I tell them, like, look, if you crush in your five minutes, it will turn into 10. If yeah. you crush in your 10, it can turn into 15. Mm-hmm. 15 can turn into 20, 25. Yeah. So don't look at it as like, man, they yeah. only playing me 10 minutes. Yeah. Because if you walk out there with the mentality that, oh, I'm only going to get 10 minutes. What am I supposed to do in 10? It's like, mm-hmm. no, I got 10 minutes. Let's go make something happen. Right. right? And, right. and people yeah. don't have that mentality. Sometimes they're defeated before they ever even get on the yeah. court or to their actual time because they're frustrated knowing that they're only going to get a short time to really show what they can do. Yeah, well well said. And 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 lots yeah. of guys uh they they kind of trip cuz they're, you know, a little jealous or envious of guys who get the long minutes and say the only reason they're doing that, I mean, I'm just as good as he is, but he just gets longer minutes. You mm-hmm. know, they get the long minutes cuz they earn the long minutes. Mhm. And in most cases. Mm-hmm. In most cases. So so you can't hate on a guy who's getting long minutes and and you have to be ready and when you get your time, you know, Make make yeah, your mark. Make your mark. Because coaches, go to work. coaches want to win. Coaches they they want to win. Yeah, they're they not they're win. not sitting you because you, you can help them win. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Speaking so. of time, we are here in Vegas, and I don't want to keep you longer than we already have. I could go on and on forever with you, um, but I will not do that to you. However, I do have, just have a couple more questions for you. Okay. Um, and Richard, if you have any more, please let me know. Oh, um, man, I'm 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 over here in love and life. <laughs> are you drinking anything? I, I am not drinking. What is wrong with you? He's training right now. You know, I just I, 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 I felt like it wasn't fair for me to be drinking here and not be with you guys. So I, I just Aww, and, and you know what? I, I'm so I'm so locked in on the dock right now. Man. <laughs> so, you got a natural so high. I, 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 if, he, if he was if he was if we were all together, then I could kind of relax. But right now, yeah. I'm just so I'm just so amped up that he that, that we're sitting and having a conversation. So I didn't, I didn't want to be fuzzy at all. <laughs> oh, thank you. We appreciate yeah, no that. No problem. Uh, but you have a book out. Uh, mm-hmm. Dr. J autobiography. Yes, I do. Um, and, and I have learned something about this book. Okay. It's a decade book. A decade of. book. In terms of. Oh yeah, yeah. The 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 decades of my life. Yeah. You know that that was uh, <clears throat> when I did an outline when I was in my forties. Mm-hmm. You know, I was capturing uh, people, places, and thing and things. People, places, and things that were of significance in my life, and uh, you know I had. The yellow pad, you know, my team knows about me and the yellow pad. <laughs> I bring out the yellow pad. They know some notes are going in there. Oh, we got to talk about the yellow the pad. The whole deal, the yellow pad. So anyway, but uh, so I had, a, you know, a collection of a lot of notes. So when I decided to uh, put pen to pad and get a ghostwriter um, for like the fourth time, <laughs> we found a guy who we thought would be the right guy to do the book. And then the Olympics in China came, and he got an assignment because he was a Sports Illustrated guy. And when he got back, he said, you know, I can't finish the book because uh, my job is going to fire me if I take the time to work with you on the book. And he was a guy who was from Long Island, and he had gone to Amherst College, and I went to UMass. So we had a lot of similar experiences and a pretty good chemistry. But both of us were somewhat procrastinators. So the guy who I eventually uh, got with, um, you know, we went to work. We knocked it out in less than six months. Wow. And, and, covered, That's awesome. and covered, you know, 60 plus years. And, and it was the decades. You know, the first decade was kind of like zero to nine, and then mm-hmm. it was 10 to 19, and, and 20 to 29, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and that's, that's how it reads. Um, and it's how, I, it's how I see my life because with each decade or, or at some point, in time within each decade, there was some sort of event that became a change agent in my life. And, um, you know, early in my life, it was one of my cousins, you know, being lost in a drowning accident and experiencing, you know, that, that funeral. And in the second decade, I actually lost my brother uh, when I was 19. He was 16. Um, and, uh, you know, in my 20s, I was going into the pros and the different things associated with that, moving around. And, you know, with, with each decade, I, I think the book is of interest um, to people. I, I pretty much wrote it 
as a family uh, legacy play for generations, you know, after my generation uh, to know about me. Mm-hmm. And the stuff that I, I, I want them to know that I can't physically tell them because I'm not in contact with all of them. And, and from a family perspective, you know, the Irving name, and the Abney name, which was my grandparents' name, my mother's maiden name. Uh, so, you know, writing it and making it that personal and making it that uh, intimate in terms of real uh, conversation and, and, and real stuff in the book, you know, uh, real disclosures. So uh, so the fact that it was for sale to the public and is, is for the public is... You know, I mean, I've had a great relationship with the public, and mm-hmm. public has, you know, treated me like family. And and uh, you know, I mean, I've been one of the friendly stars, uh, approachable, and whatever. So, um, you know, I think it. I think the initial reason, even though a lot of people understand it, was for me and my family that they took an interest in it, and you know, it became a bestseller when it first came out, which was which was mm-hmm. good had some sort of sustained uh, power in terms of uh, people come up and start conversations with me, you know, about the book and about parts of the book. And um, and we followed the book with a documentary, mm-hmm. you know, on my life, uh, which was powerful and brought people to tears. And when I talk about it or if I watch it, it brings me to tears, you know, because it was uh, life hasn't been you know a cakewalk and there's, there's been the ups and downs and there's been the roller coaster ride that probably most people experience in life and and mine was all a part of my story and they and they make my story what it is we i know richard mentioned our 12 <coughs> listeners um we actually have quite a few listeners all across <laughs> the globe and so we'd like to think that if there's something that you say on this podcast it's going to reach millions Mm -hmm. of of people Mm -hmm. so with that said in this moment if if there is uh, a life lesson or a piece of advice that you could give based off of your life Mm -hmm. and what it is that that moves you that that could be impactful to others what would that be well uh, i mean i think this you definitely have to find something that you embrace uh at some point in your life and that is going to be one of those change agents which is going to kind of direct you and give you a clearer focus in terms of um, what you're eventually going to become. I mean, you know, the fundamental things in school, you know, one one of the things we're blessed with in America is the fact that, you know, part of our tax dollars go to allow us to go to school mm-hmm. and, and get an education. You know, don't think for one second that it's like that all around the world. It's not all around the world. So, you know, that whole K through 18, K through K through 12 uh, process, that's meaningful. And, uh, and it's then that during that time where you probably get shaped and molded and develop an attitude and develop uh uh you know what you prioritize uh in terms of what you like and what you don't like and 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 the direction that you're going to go in so you know i think taking that seriously as opposed to uh you know somebody <laughs> you you run into people who are like 25 30 they're like Best time I had was when I was in high school. That's uh, me right now. That is me right now. <laughs> I was like, well, that's a shame. You know, the, the best, best that's time of right your now. life, best time of your life is behind you. Heaven, I want the best time of my life to be in front of me. And I'm 67. I'm still looking for the best time in my life. And I've had a lot of good times. So, so yeah, keep the carrot out in front of you. You know, keep yeah. keep that out. Don't you? You uh, you talked about Doc. You talked about. Um, you got real philosophical at one point in time. Were there some books that you would recommend that you read? Are there authors or speakers that, that you listened to that kind of had an impact on you? Um, and just kind of e- even either when you played or after you were retired looking for that next goal, that next step, was there a book or an author, like I said, or a speaker that, that kind of touched that you would recommend to people? Well, the, the, the two mentors uh, in my life <clears throat> and I met both of them when I was in college and uh, Bill Russell came to my campus and uh, he, he gave a talk he had just recently retired uh, as player coach Boston Celtics and he asked me to go have a cup of coffee with him and I 
I said, all right, let's go. So we go to the student union. And then three hours later, you know, after he has sat there and really just just opened up and told me so many things that I didn't have any perspective about. Um, you know, I knew that my, my life was changed forever. I was I was going to see things a lot differently than I had seen them in the first 19 years of my life. And uh, and Bill Cosby came to uh, UMass, and I, I, I went to practice, and I wanted to go use the Whirlpool. And I walk into the training room, and he's sitting in the Whirlpool. And... Uh, this is around the same time. I'm 19. I'm before my 20th birthday, and uh, and I look at him. <laughs> and I'm like, oh shit, Bill Cosby. <laughs> what? So I'm like, I'm looking in my pocket or whatever. You know, I'm trying to get an autograph. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'll try to get an autograph. So I eventually found, you know, the little schedules they used to give us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Found a little schedule. I take it over there. Mr. Cobby, can you sign this schedule? He signs it and whatever. And he's like, you know, what's your name? And I said, you know, Julius Irving. He said, yeah, you know, I heard about you. He said, good things I heard about, about you. <laughs> he did. He did. He, he said it. And I said, yeah. So, um, so I, after that time, next time I saw him was three years later. And uh, and it was in the south of France. And, oh, wow. and we were at this place. I was vacationing at this place called Cap d'Antibes, and that was like one of his favorite places to go. And uh, and then we recalled, you know, that meeting, and he extended the hand of friendship, and, you know, and he's been a lifelong friend and mentor mm -hmm. in, in that regard. So, so those two people uh, were very, very instrumental in terms of me. And, and, and I, I like... Uh, I like nonfiction. Okay. You know, uh, and uh, so I wanted to be real. Mm -hmm. uh, so, in, so in terms of books, you know, when I read Marvin Gaye's story, you know, what's going on, and uh, autobiographies of various people. Those, mm -hmm. those things were always impactful. But, you know, I never read about anything that I didn't have the ability to do. Mm -hmm. So I still has yet to to do that that I would really want to do. So nobody's mm -hmm. nobody's brought something into the to the table right now that was unattainable, and I and I feel a certain empowerment because of that. You know, and, and basketball has been largely responsible. Uh, the different mentors in my life, um, in my family, um, my friends. You know, they've they've all empowered me with being able to have a full life. And uh, and one of my great mentors, a guy named Mr. Ray Wilson, <coughs> who's no longer with us, um, you know, he used to always say, you're the wealthiest person on the planet if you have peace of mind. He said, they could talk about all the diamonds, gold, and money, and cars, and, and whatever. And and he always said this, and he, he came to my life when I was 13 years old. And he just left three years ago. Um so, so I take that to heart, and I pass that on to my children, grandchildren, and and anybody who will listen. I'm listening. You know, if you have, <laughs> I'm you have you, about you, ten, you, about you, ten more yeah, people happy, listening uh, online. True happiness but, in life is having peace of mind. Yeah. Well, no, no. I, 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 honestly, just sitting down with you and just kind of vibing out. I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but it's been an honor uh, growing up. It's funny. Uh, that you talk about Bill Cosby because my parents are both Philadelphia people. Yeah. Uh, they were yeah. huge, uh, huge Bill Cosby people. Yeah. Uh, you know, growing up watching the Cosby Show, and even uh, my, my my I always tell people my my number one famous person story is with Bill because uh, he was friends. Uh, uh, he was he knew people at the Nets, and mm -hmm. so he came to a game, mm -hmm. and, and he actually reached out and called my parents one time. Is he called right? me. Bill wow. called me and said, hey, Richard, uh, I, I heard because uh, my parents used to always joke because I used to always argue and I always thought I was funny. So they said, Richard, either you're going to be a comedian or you're going to be a lawyer. <laughs> and, and they said, you're not going to be a comedian. When, ever since I was like 10 years old, my parents were like, you aren't a comedian unless Bill Cosby tells me you're a comedian. Mm. So I tell somebody this story. And, and so Bill finds out, calls me and says, hey, I, I, I hear uh, – that your parents think you can only be a comedian uh, if I call them. And at this point in time, I'm like freaking out. Right? I'm just like, what? 
Wait, really? And so I try and crack a joke. It didn't go over well. <laughs> I was like, here, uh, uh, I was like, here, here's my parents' number. Uh, if you could please call him. And to this day, he, you know, has kept in touch with my parents. He, mm. he called, um, he called my parents right then. And my parents, it took him about two, it took my parents two or three minutes to realize what was going on. Right. But, uh, they were like, what? Cause he didn't like, Hey, this is yeah. Bill. He just kind of yeah. talked. He's like, so your son is pretty funny. And, <laughs> and he just kind of went on this long thing. So yeah, no, j- just being, uh, again, growing my parents growing up, I lived in Philadelphia for a short amount of time. So it, it, it's funny that, that Bill had, had that yeah. impact uh, on, on you also. So, yeah. but thank you again for coming on this and, and taking the time out of your, uh, of your day. Uh, th- this was amazing, man. This is you, you, to me, this has been one of my, my, my probably most favorite, um, podcasts that we've done just because I'm such a fan and, and you're such an icon. So for Richard to be in the league, going on 17 years, mm-hmm. his secret is kind of saying volleyball. And <laughs> we drug him off. We Actually, we didn't have to. We didn't have to drag him off the, the sand. He yeah. was like, tell me when and where, and I'll be there. Okay. So, which okay. is not easy for this guy. Okay. But no, hey. it's not. They, yeah. they, they beach, they volleyball. beach volleyball. Yeah. Beach volleyball. Beach volleyball. You know, Wilt Will, Will, Will used to do that. I mean, he Will became a very, big, very big fan big. of beach volleyball. So there's actually you know. posters of him up at some of the local tournaments, and they show yeah. like Will Chamberlain playing volleyball. Scott yeah. Bill Walton played a lot of volleyball. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's changed. It's changed me. They always I said think. he did it because of the girls. Oh, hundred <laughs> percent. There's no, there's no other sport yeah. where the Manhattan Beach Open was just here. <laughs> the Manhattan <laughs> Beach and Open. No other sport where you could just watch girls run around in bikinis yeah. and then go drink beer up at the bar and come back yeah. down. There's, there's no sport in the world. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it yeah. to Richard. It was a good note to close on. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, no. But of course, so, I second what Richard said as well. It's been an honor. Uh, we we truly appreciate you coming in here and and chatting with us. Uh, we love what we do here at Road Trippin, and we're glad that you're a part of it. So, yeah. to right. total yeah. wine yeah. and more for having yeah. us, our guests very here, welcome. Richard. Thank you so much for, for being a part. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. For the doctor, Richard All Jefferson, right. Rafa, myself, your host, Dolly yeah. Clifton. That's another edition of Road Trippin. Hey, Road Tripping fans, I'm working with a t-shirt company that you may have seen around, Amish. They're the ones that are responsible for LeBron's ultimate warrior shirt and many of the college designs you see on tees. As they pay homage to great moments in sports and inspiring stories, go check out their NBA Jam tees at homage.com. You're sure to be inspired and will get a kick out of their special design of Richard and Channing. Get them while they're still in stock at homage.com. And better yet, from now until the end of August, receive our exclusive Road Trippin' NBA Jam tee 25% off when using promo code Road Trippin'. That's 25% off when using code Road Trippin', not case sensitive, through the end of the month. Get them while they're hot at homage.com.